Felix Rodriguez, author of Shadow Warrior, the CIA hero of a hundred unknown battles. Let me read you one sentence from page 65 and get your reaction. I volunteered to assassinate Fidel Castro and the Americans took me up on it. Why'd you write that? Well, it was in 1960 when we were in the training camps in, uh, actually we were in Panama then for final training before the Bay of Pigs. And a friend of mine and I discussed it and we thought that would shorten the war in Cuba if Fidel were taken out. So we, we called our case officer at that time in, in the area in Panama where we were and we volunteered to, to kill Fidel. We were at that time uh, about seven, uh, 19 years old then. How close did you get? Well, we were given uh, a rifle with a telescopic sight and we were three times we attempted to infiltrate Cuba with a boat uh, that had a Ukrainian crew on it, plus an American captain, and we went twice close to the coastline, and the, the boat who were supposed to meet us never arrived. And uh, so on the third attempt, after the third attempt, we returned it. They told us that the plan had been changed, had been canceled, so they took the rifle away. They added two more members, uh, Cubans, to my team, and we went in as a member of the infiltration team for Las Villas province. Didn't give it any second thought to kill another human being. Well, if you have seen how many people Fidel have killed, how many of our friends he has assassinated, it's a, it's a different perspective, it's a different situation. Uh, we don't believe that a government should be involved in that. But at the same time, like the same people, uh, like the Israeli, or not the Israeli, the Jewish people, if you tell them that Hitler were alive, uh, I think there will be a lot of people trying to get him. I guess it's the same or similar situation with the Cubans. Have you known a lot of people in your life that have said the same thing, that they'd be glad to kill Fidel Castro? Oh, yes. Many. How come no one's ever gotten the job done? Some have tried, and Fidel have a very, very good security system. In the past, he had a Czechoslovakian who run his, who run his security force, and he moved from one place to the other. For example, when I was in Havana, I saw him moving uh, in near the Malecon area with five bulletproof Mercedes all exactly the same, with the same antennas. Uh, you could not tell one from the other. And he, I believe, ride it either in number two up to number four in between. So you never know which one of the five car he was going to be in. It was very hard to get him. What will happen when he uh, no longer is in power? I think it's going to be a tremendous uh, power struggle inside Cuba. I, I, I still believe that it will happen pretty soon. There is a lot of problems right now between him uh, and his brother uh, Raul is trying to, uh, to get seize power or, or be in a position to seize power if anything happened to Fidel. And there is a lot of problems, in my opinion, between Raul uh, group and other groups in the Cuban military. That we have seen, for example, the, the execution of General Ochoa, which was from a different group, the group of Cuban generals who were in Africa, the Cuban generals that were in Angola, in Ethiopia, in Nicaragua. Uh, and the other group that are just friends to Raul Castro, which is not part of that elite corps. And there is a lot of problems in, among both groups, or between both groups in there. Today, uh, tell us your status. Are you an American citizen? Yes, I am. How long have you been one? Since 1969. How long did you serve in, <clears throat> excuse me, in the U.S. military? Well, after the Bay of Pigs, uh, President Kennedy gave a commission to the officers in the brigade uh, to be member of the armed forces of the United States. And I was uh, given a presidential commission as a second lieutenant in the army in Fort Benning, Georgia. And I only resigned because uh, Manuel Artime, who was uh, the civilian leader of the brigade, came to me at that time in, in uh, Fort Benning, Georgia, and told me that the president had, had personally authorized an operation to overthrow Fidel. And thus, I believe, also go closely with the fact that President Kennedy was assassinated. Uh, I believe very strongly that Fidel's hand was behind that. After President Kennedy's uh, failure with the Bay of Pigs, he got all the Cubans out of prison who went in the, were captured during the Bay of Pigs. And in the Orange Bowl in Miami, he gathered with all of them after they were put out of Cuba and promised to return uh, the brigade flag in a free Havana. And after that, he took definitely measures to that effect. He gave us commission in the armed forces, and then he uh, started and organized a special operation out of Nicaragua, where I was a participant for. As a matter of fact, uh, at that point in time, I specifically asked proof that the U.S. government was involved in that operation against Fidel. And they said, what do you need? And I said, well, if you wanted me to take a special communication training, I'd like to, to have it in uniform, even though it has nothing to do with the Army. And they said, okay, no problem. And sure enough, uh, a few weeks later, Mr. Moose and Mr. Flanagan showed up in Fort Benning, Georgia, 
I was given a special training for communication for that project that was sponsored by the President of the United States. Um, three of us resigned to the, our commission to participate in there. So how long, uh, wh where do you live now? <clears throat> Miami. How big is your family? Well, I have a son, a daughter, and my wife. Uh, my father is still alive. And where do you work now? Well, I am retired from the agency since 1976, but I have continued to support, uh, like when I went to El Salvador, uh, back in 1985, I went there as a volunteer uh, to help the Salvadorian government with the helicopter concept that I knew was going to be a valid operation, and it proved to be so. We were able to capture in our first operation on the 18th of April of 1985, Nidia Diaz, the commander who happens to be also the commander from the PRTC that was the unit who assassinated the Marines uh, later on. Uh, we captured her, and she was later exchanged by President Duarte's daughter, and Nidia Diaz now lives in Havana. So it was, it was a, uh, a very valid, uh, I believe, concept, which proved to be uh, very effective in El Salvador. You said that you retired from the agency. What right. agency? CIA in 1976. How long did you work for it? Oh, I worked since 1960, like I say, on and off a few times. Like when I went to the Army, uh, I left it and then back again. Can you afford to live now without, uh, I mean, do you have a, you have a, a means of income? Besides yes, I have my retirement uh, that I receive, and also my wife work uh, at the University of Miami, uh, Barry University of Miami. Show the audience what this book looks like, and uh, it's, it's brand new. It's called Shadow Warrior. Uh, the CIA, as you can see, uh, uh, here is another name down here, and it's John Weissman. Who's he? He's the co-author of the book, and actually he's the man responsible to a great extent for the book, because he was the one who convinced me to write my autobiography. Why did he care? Well, I, he saw me testify in Congress, and uh, at the beginning he told me that he thought it was a great novel, and then he went back and he thought that it was a very good story to tell, and uh, he finally got through a common friend that we had uh, to me and convinced me for, it took him a lot, about six months to convince me to uh, write the book. And I think one of the... Uh, the factors that contributed quite a bit to that was the, the, the well, let's see, the, um, one of the factors that contributed most to that was what I had to go through and my family had to go through with Senator Kerry's committee. And I thought it was a good idea then to write the book and set the record straight on that account. When was the first time you ever told anybody that you worked for the CIA outside of your family, in other words, publicly? Well, uh, after I retired, uh, I retire openly, so when I retire, I could tell people that I work for the CIA. I requested when I retire, which I was proud to work for the CIA, and I requested an open retirement, which means I didn't need any cover. Since all my participation with the agency in operations were uh, known to the uh, host government, where I was, uh, they saw no reason in it, and I got an open retirement. So I legally can tell people that I retired from the agency from 1976 on, and that's when I told people about it. Are there things that you did for the agency that you can't tell? Yes, I think that uh, there are things that should not be told but for the same reason there are operations that are still uh, going on or still giving fruits and if it be revealed it will completely uh, destroy its value. Did you have to have this book cleared by the CIA? Yes, I did. Were there things that you had written that they took out? It was very little that they took out because I made sure that I didn't put anything that would compromise people or operations. So there were some technical words that the that we had no problem with. We were very closely together uh, in reviewing the book, and there are a few things that the, we found it was a very valid request, and we took it out, and all that we requested to keep it in, and, and they saw there was no need to take it out, and, and we worked it out, and we had a clearance for the book. John Wiseman, how did the two of you work together? Did you talk this through to him? Uh, did you do it in a tape recorder? Did you write? or did? Well, no, we got together and I used to talk to him about the different experience and he will tape it and then he will come back with manuscript and we'll discuss it and he'll write it and I'd, uh, they were seeing that uh, I didn't feel were accurate uh, because it's hard to, to project it that way until we finally got it that uh, I like very much what came out in the book. Who is John Wiseman? What's his background? Well, he's, uh, he used to be working for TV Guy before uh, he had written several novels, and uh, I like him very much personally, and I think he's a fantastic writer. And uh, he took the interest in the book, and, uh, and I think he came out a very good book, in my opinion. Did the two of you agree politically? Was that necessary? Uh, I don't think it would be necessary. It was just a matter of putting uh, my uh, story uh, in the book uh, as truthfully as possible and as accurate as possible, and I think he, he had done that. 
Where were you born? Oh, I was born in Cuba. Where? I was born actually in Havana, but I claimed uh, my hometown to be Santi Espiritu, which is, uh, I was just taken by, not by one say by mistake, but I was taken to Havana because I came in a, in a position that needed a more specialized doctor. So I was born in Havana, but I consider myself a Espirituano uh, from Santi Espiritu, where I was raised. Born in 1941? 1941. What were your parents like? Oh, we had a, a great life. Uh, we had a very close family in Cuba. Uh, and my father used to have a store that my grandfather gave him and worked in there along with my mother in Santi Espiritus in Las Villas. And uh, we were one of these families that uh, we used to go and uh, have, for example, uh, on New Year's Eve, we used to meet in my grandmothers and all the sons and daughters would get together there. It was a very, very close family. What's this picture? That's from my, my home, my hometown, that's my home in Santi Espiritu where I was raised and in the bottom is where uh, my parents when they got married. And your parents alive? My mother died, uh, my father is still alive. Where does uh, he live? He lives in Miami with us. Uh, we have a, a big house, a sort of a uh, condominium type and my father lived with, with me on the, on the other side. What did he do for a living? Well, he had a store in Cuba. I mean, he used to, uh, to have a all kind of, uh, to buy what you call it, a general store, that would especially presents and things like that and that he's selling there. How did you, as a family, leave Cuba? Well, I came to school back in 1953-54 to Pennsylvania to go to high school. So I went to procurement preparatory school until I finally graduated in 1960. And uh, but we used to live in San Spirit. And I used to commute back and forth and go back to, to Cuba just about two, three times a year to visit them. Why did you go to school in Pennsylvania? Well, my uncle uh, offered me to go to school and had another uncle who convinced me how important it was to have an education outside to be able to speak another language. And it will help me through my life in the future. Uh, I wanted actually to be an architect and an engineer like my uncles were. But because of the Cuban, I, instead of going to the University of Miami, which I was accepted, I decided to go and fight for my country. What did you learn in Pennsylvania about uh, what your own interests were? Mm -hmm. In Pennsylvania, when you went to school there, did, did you, what did you begin to think was, were, were you going to be your interests? And, and where did you go after school? Well, my, my interest when I went to high school first there was the engineering and architect. But as things turned uh, different in Cuba back in 1959 when Fidel took over, uh, I concentrated my, my thought and, and to be able to return to my country. And uh, that's the thing that uh, prevailed uh, then and, and now. Uh, I think it's my, my main objective in life. That's why I went to the training camps, in the, first of all, in the Dominican Republic. That was the first auction that we had, and it was not with the agency at the time. It was back in 1959. And then later, uh, when the opportunity arose to, to go to Guatemala, uh, for later became the Bay of Pig Invasion, uh, then I went there and tried my best to, to go back to Cuba. Where did you get your dislike, and I'm sure that's a mild word, for Fidel Castro. Can you remember? Well, uh, when he started the, the firing squad and the assassination, plus before my family had told me that he was a communist and uh, uh, he had the background that was not widely publicized of participating in the Bogotá in Colombia many years before there was a communist-inspired uh, situation. And as he progressed in his regime and assassinated people and indiscriminately put people in jail. They continue to create my desire to, uh, to create the democratic government in Cuba, which it still is. Can you remember when you had a sense, though, that you could assassinate him, though? When, when did you first feel strongly enough about this that you could kill him? Well, we were in the training camps when we saw that there was, uh, we were all preparing to go for the invasion for enforcing there. And we thought that this would be, like I said before, an opportunity to shorten the war in there. Instead of having a long-term war, if we eliminate Fidel, which was the head of the revolution, it would probably be easier for all the rest of the forces to come in and seize power. Who's Che Guevara? Che Guevara was uh, one of the members who landed with Fidel in Cuba uh, when he first went to the Sierra Maestro to fight against Batista. A well-known uh, well revolutionary uh, who then left Cuba and went to Africa in 1965 and then went to Bolivia in 1966, at the end of 1966. Where was he from originally? Argentina. Argentina. And it, uh, it's something that you take great pleasure in here in this book, telling the story about Che Guevara. Why? Well, it's not that I take it a great pleasure. It's part of the history, part well, of what Well, what I happened. meant by that is you talk about it being one of your most memorable moments on the day that uh, yes. you can t tell the story. Sure. Well, uh, 
for a long time, uh, he had been one of our greatest adversaries. He was one of the people who headed the La Cabaña forges and who actually assassinated thousands of Cubans in there. And when I was told by the agency in 1967 that uh, he was in Bolivia, would I participate uh, after they talked to me, I thought it was uh, a fantastic challenge to go there and try to roll back what he was trying to do in Central America, the same thing that had happened in Cuba. How did he die? Well, when I arrived this is to the Bolivia... Two of you, by the way. Hmm? This picture, is of the two of you right here? Right, that's, that's the only picture ever of uh, Commander Guevara in captivity. Uh, it had never been made public until this year. And everybody thought probably they never existed. And that's why I believe that recently they called the Cuban interest section and they said that their official version of Che's death was that he died in combat. How did this picture then become public? Well, I had the pictures and uh, finally uh, now a lot of people convinced they should release it with the book. And, uh, it would be interesting to people and also tell the story of how it happened. Because a lot of people have claims uh, from different sides how Che Guevara died. If you take a version from the far right, you take a version from the far left, they are 180 degrees apart. And I thought for the benefit of history that the story should be told the way it happened without taking it apart for how historical it, purposes. How did it happen? Well, I guess it was definitely one of the highlights of my life. It's a situation that I did face in Bolivia, which I hope I don't have to face again. Uh, but, for example, we, we went there as an advisor to the 2nd Ranger Battalion, who was the battalion under the 8th Division that was uh, operating the area where he was. Let, let me stop you just a second. This was in what year? 1967. And you were working for the agency? Right. Assigned to Bolivia? Right. Assigned to work with the government of Bolivia. And one of the reasons that they chose me and my friend, another Cuban, was that we were not U.S. citizens at the time. And there was a prohibition by the U.S. ambassador in Bolivia that no non-U.S. Uh, uh, citizen could go, but no U.S. citizen could participate in the operational area, avoiding a conflict. Uh, so I had not the limitation because I was not a citizen. So I was able to accompany the, the units or being in real conflicting areas in the area. And go ahead and tell the story. Okay. When uh, I first uh, got there, we worked closely first at the, we, in La Esperanza with the uh, Second Ranger Battalion. My friend concentrated uh, mostly in uh, training what we call the eyes and ears of the battalion. Uh, there was a specialized unit of uh, people who spoke the Quechua and the Aymara, farmers from the area that were just turned into soldiers. And they were to go in civilian clothes when the battalion were to be deployed. Uh, to be able to talk to the farmers and get the information to feed the intelligence to the battalion. At the same time, I concentrated mostly in operating at the division level with Colonel Centeno, who was later assassinated in Paris by the so-called Commando Che Guevara, uh, being ambassador of Bolivia in, in, in France. And I was an advisor to the colonel and to his uh, head of intelligence at the time. So we were able to track uh, all the movement of Che, and I w used to accompany the, the head of intelligence to whenever there was an encounter with the guerrillas by other units, Bolivian units. Uh, for example, we were able to, to keep alive uh, Paco, Jose Castillo Chavez, who I interrogated and gave us the in-depth uh, intelligence on how Che's group operated with the vanguard, central, and rear guard. Because of his intelligence, we were able to determine uh, when Lieutenant Galindo had an encounter and killed three guerrillas. One of them was a Cuban by the name of Miguel. The other one was a Bolivian doctor called Mario Gutierrez Hardaya and another Bolivian leader called Coco Peredo. We knew from Pacua these were the three forward elements of Che and that Che was in the area. So with this information, was able to go back to Colonel Centeno and recommend that the training should be cut short of the battalion that was being specially trained by the U.S. Special Forces. So he cut two weeks uh, out of the train that had to be for just for graduation purposes and moved the battalion into the area at the very end of uh, September. I guess it's also a great element of luck that on the uh, 7th of uh, October, the intelligence unit that we had trained, or my friend actually had trained, had a uh, conversation with uh, campesinos or farmers in the area who told them that they were voices at the Quebrada del Churro, where uh, nobody was supposed to be. So he passed this information to uh, the captain of the company that was operating or raiding the area from this battalion, and they put a, a cirque a surrounded around that specific area on the evening of the 7th of October. On the 8th, when they first started to move, they had the first encounter with the guerrilla. They were able to capture uh, Commander Guevara alive uh, with another Bolivian called uh, Simon Cubas, 
war name was Willy. Um, and at that point in time, I was uh, actually setting up communication gear in airplanes in two, well, now they are very old, single-engine planes that the Bolivian had and had no communication with the ground troops. So I took the time to put the antennas and to put a PRC-10 radio that was compatible, to have a compatible communication from the air to the ground. So when that arrived, and uh, they were still not clear, uh, you can imagine what uh, sensation of, uh, of uh, not only happiness, but uh, it's hard to explain uh, that probably Guevara was captured, and nobody could really believe it. So I got into the back seat of one of the planes, and Major Serrat into the back of the other one. We flew over the area, and we confirmed that it was what they call Papa, who was the leader of the guerrilla uh, council, and then they say El Extranjero, which is the foreigner. So we knew they was shit. So we returned from there, and uh, that evening uh, we gathered at the, uh, at the um, hotel in Valle Grande, and I asked Colonel Centeno I wanted to accompany him. And he spoke to his uh, people in there and, and told them that how much uh, we had helped them. And if they didn't mind, he knew how much it meant to me to be face to face with uh, my enemy for many, many years. So he agreed, and everybody agreed in the area. And on the following day, uh, we flew at 7 o'clock in the morning on a small helicopter. The pilot who was Major Jaime Nino de Guzman, Colonel Centeno, myself into La Higuera. So we first came in and uh, we landed right beside the schoolhouse where he was. And Colonel Centeno and another officer and myself went into the room. He asked a few questions from Shea and he would look at him and not answer. And so he left uh, the area and went back to the operational area where still you could hear the fighting going on. They were still shooting uh, less than a kilometer from there with the rest of the guerrilla was in the general uh, area. So I set up uh, my uh, sort of a shop, little uh, photographing uh, area there to photograph the diary and all the documents that he had with him. So I asked Colonel Centeno, he made available to me his uh, bag where he had all the documents and everything. And once in a while I would go in and the first time I came in, I looked at him and he was tied down. Uh, it, it was an emotional moment. Uh, to see this man that I have seen before uh, in his day of glory in Moscow and in, uh, in China. And now I saw this man on the floor uh, in rags, uh, destroyed, beaten, and, and in front of him were the dead body of two Cubans that were very close to him. So I look at him and I say, Che Guevara, I'd like to talk to you. Uh, he looked at me very arrogantly and said, uh, nobody interrogates me. I wish I look back and say, look, I didn't come here to interrogate you. Say, our ideals are different, but I admire you. You used to be ahead of a stay in Cuba and you are like this because you believe in your ideal. I just came to talk to you. So he looked to me for about a minute or so and so if I was sincere. Uh, so then he, he said, can I sit? Can you untie me? And I said, sure. So I ordered one of the soldiers in there to come in and untie him and we sat him in a little bench. He asked for some tobacco for his pipe. So I got a cigarette from one of the soldiers and he started smoking his pipe and we had a conversation on and off because I had to continue to First of all, send a message by radio and also radio operator uh, by telegraphy to headquarters in Washington. I was already prepared the day before. And at the same time, finished photographing the diary. So I came in several times. Uh, there was one point in time when the helicopter arrived that had left to take out our wounded, our killed, and bring back food and ammunition. And the mayor, uh, Nino de Guzman, brought a camera to take a picture of the prisoner. And I had my camera, I didn't even thought of that at the time. So I asked him, do you mind, and the commander, and he said, no. So we took him outside, and that's the picture we're looking at. And uh, after that, uh, when I was still there, and Colonel Centeno was still out in the field, we got a phone call from Valle Grande. It's only one telephone in La Higuera, which is the, the small village where he was. And that phone call uh, brought the instruction from the high command of the Bolivian government to eliminate the prison. So when Colonel Centeno came down, I was the highest ranking officer at the time, I had the rank of captain in the area, and there was only a lieutenant at the Gueras. So they called me, I took the phone call. So I, when, uh, when Colonel Centeno uh, returned uh, to leave, I called him aside and I told him that there was instruction from his high command to eliminate the prisoner. And my instruction from the U.S. government was to try to keep him alive. But we should say, look, uh, well, we know you have tried to, and you have helped us a great deal, but this is order from my high command and you can eliminate it any way you want it. We know how much harm he has done to your country. But I want your word of honor that you will bring me back the dead body of Che Guevara at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And that was uh, about the middle in the morning. So I told him, the Coronel tried to change their mind, because it's my instruction, but if there is not uh, any other uh, instruction from you, I'll give you my word of honor that I will bring you back the dead body of Che Guevara. 
I continued to talk to him back and forth in, in there until one time I left the room and the school teacher, uh, girl, a lady, came to me and said, Capitan, why are you going to kill him? I say, lady, why are you saying that? I say, well, we have seen you in there, uh, photograph with him, and, and she brought a small portable radio and said, that here is the, uh, the radio saying that uh, he had died from combat wounds already. So at that point, I thought it was not much point of continuing uh, to wait. It was after 12.30 uh, noontime. I went into the room, he was sitting, I look at him and say, Commander, I'm sorry. These are orders from the High Bolivian Command. He turned white like a piece of paper. I've never seen anybody lose the color of his face like he did. But he didn't move a muscle. He looked at me straight and said, Felix, it's better this way. I should have never been captured alive. He pulled out the pipe and said, I'd like to give this pipe to a soldadito, a small soldier who treated me well. And at that point in time, Sergeant Terran broke into the room and said, Yo la quiero, I want it, you know, I want the pipe. So she had the pipe outside and said, no, I won't give it to you. So I ordered twice for him to leave until he finally left the room. He, he worked with the pipe like this and said, Commander, will you give it to me? So he thought for a while and said, yes. A ti si te la doy, which means, yes, to you I will give. And he gave me the pipe. I put it away, and then I, uh, I told him, uh, is there anything you want for, for your family? So he looked at me, and uh, I, I, you could detect very easily it was uh, a lot of sadness and, and sarcastic in his voice when he said that, uh, tell Fidel that he will soon see a triumphant revolution in America. Then he changed and said, and tell my wife to remarry and try to be happy. So we shook hands, uh, we embraced. It, it was definitely a very emotional moment that never in my life have been in a situation where I had to tell somebody he's going to be killed. I hope I don't have to go through that again. And uh, after that, uh, I left the room and when he stood in attention in the back, like he thought maybe I was going to be the one killing him. I really didn't uh, want even to be there I left the room, I called Sergeant Terran, who I knew was doing that in there, and said, Sergeant, don't shoot from here down. This man is supposed to die from combat wounds, or from here up, just from here down. And uh, I left the room. It, it was 1 o'clock in the afternoon. About 1.10, I was uh, right beside the table I had set up to take out the, the pictures. I heard the fire. So I looked at my watch and I took note that it was uh, 1.10 when he died. Surprised at how compassionate you were. Uh with him at that point? At that point in time, you really cannot... Uh, it's, it's exactly what happened. Uh, you know, a lot of people uh, sometimes have criticized me for it, but it's something at that point in time you cannot control. It's the way it happened. I guess as an enemy, I respected the man who died with dignity. And uh, he was uh, very, very dangerous because he strongly believed in his ideal, even though it were wrong. Uh, but that's, uh, I can tell you, that's the the exact version of how he died. Because you will find when you read a lot of papers, uh, like you say, from both sides, completely different attitudes. What did you do then with the body? Well, at, uh, after a while, uh, two captains came from the Bolivians, and we all went in. Uh, after they left there, I washed his face. Uh, they had mud on the face, and got him on the helicopter, on the riot ski of the helicopter, and we were ready to leave the um, there is a soldier who came and told the pilot, Nino de Guzman, can you wait? Father Schiller wants to see him. And here comes a priest on a mule that almost got decapitated because he was just so intensely looking at the body that he didn't see that the, that the blade of the chopper was already going on. And he stopped just about this close from the blade, and he went down. He actually blessed it, which to me, you know, looking inside, I took a picture while he was doing that, and I mentally went over and said, this is a man that uh, never believed in God, never let he receive the life, right ritual of the church. Uh, we took off from there, and we landed at Valle Grande uh, area, and that's where uh, they were waiting for us, everybody sort of put my cap down, I was in uniform, and, and left, so I would be, you know, out of a, a being picture or photograph, whatever. And, of course, everybody left with the body to the hospital Nuestra Señora de Malta, where he was uh, attended there. And I stayed with the head of intelligence, uh, Major Saucedo, and the head of the operation, uh, Serrate, and, and the pilot. And then we had the meeting with uh, General uh, Ovando, who was the commander-in-chief of the armed forces. This is the book we're talking about, and the author is Felix Rodriguez, along with John Wiseman. Shadow Warrior is the title. How do you remember all this? Well, this, first of all, is very intense. It's something that... Uh, it's hard for you to raise from your mind. Second, I had to brief a lot of people. At my first briefing, of course, was the, my case officer in, in Bolivia. Then I have to give the same story to General Porter 
in Panama and other people. So uh, it's something that is not very easy to forget. Here's some more uh, photographs from the book, and uh, including uh, what is a, over here is a picture of John Kerry, senator from Massachusetts, Senator Sarbanes next to him, George Bush, the president of the United States, and uh, yours truly. Yeah. When was this taken? I was taken on May the 1st, 1986. And why were you there with the vice president? Well, I had met the vice president, uh, first of all, uh, the first time was in January. Uh, Don Gregg introduced me to him when I was going to El Salvador for the helicopter concept. And I briefed him on the helicopter concept and also showed him an album that I had for, uh, with the capture of Che Guevara. So the second time I, I went to visit him, at that point in time I was planning to leave El Salvador. I want to show uh, the audience also this note. Uh, we've seen, we've heard a lot about the presidential notes and this was from October 23rd, 1988? Right, they sent the, uh, the president-elect at the time a, uh, a Christmas car, and he was nice enough to, to answer me with another car. And he says uh, in here, yes, the truth is powerful. You have told the truth. Why was he writing to you about truth? Well, we all have been uh, so much, uh, because I believe mostly by political situation, uh, trying to implicate that he knew uh, more about those things. And we always believe that the truth is powerful and it will eventually prevail. So he was telling me that from and you know that it did prevail, the truth. You went to his inaugural. Why? Oh, I am very proud to have been there. I admire the President of the United States. And I know better than anybody else his truthfulness and his integrity. They have been put in question by a lot of people for political reasons. How do you know better than anybody else? Because everybody accused that I told him about the country. And I know that I never mentioned to him or Don Gregg anything about the country. And. This all came out in the hearings? Oh, yes. What did you think of the hearings? Well, I, I'll tell you, when I went to the hearings, a lot of people told me to bring a lawyer, in my house including. And uh, I thought that uh, it would be odd for me, if I believe in this country, uh, that I would need a lawyer to defend what I have been doing for the last 27 years at that point in time to defend the United States and my ideal. And if I needed a lawyer to defend that, then I was in the wrong country. And I don't believe I am in the wrong country. When did, proved to be so. When did you testify? It testified on the 27th and the 28th of May, 1987. Before what committee? Oh, the Grand Contra Committee. And why were you called? I was called because I was, uh, I participated uh, in the resupply of the Contra by providing uh, in El Salvador uh, the contacts to be able to launch the operation from there for a resupply of the Contras, actually. And you also testified before Senator Kerry's committee? Yes, that's another one of the motive why I wrote the book. Uh, after all the testimony in Congress, uh, he used a man called Ramon Milian Rodriguez uh, to imply that with the knowledge of the Vice President then, I had received $10 million of drug money for the Contras uh, from Milian Rodriguez. And he had proven that it was an absolute lie. I did talk to him once at the request of a lieutenant who said that Milian Rodriguez could compromise the government of Nicaragua. That he was asked on a tape of an assistant of Daniel Ortega from Guatemala to set up a laundering money uh, operation out of Panama for the benefit of the Nicaraguan government. I went and hear him out, and as soon as I finished the meeting with Milian Rodriguez, I passed the information to the FBI, and when I came to Washington, I passed the information to the CIA. And ever since, I never even talked to the guy again in my life. And Kerry used this individual who had been put in jail for 46 years uh, into promoting the idea that uh, I, the vice president knew about it and uh, authorized this type of operation. I was involved in getting the money for the country. Actually, I was in El Salvador flying at the time when my wife called me and told me there was a, uh, in the, a story in the Miami Herald uh, saying about that, which I told her, forget about it. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's nothing true to it. But she was very concerned because people don't know us. And they read this in the paper and it's very detrimental to you, to your family, and to your integrity. So I did go and testify in private with Senator Kerry. Uh, it was a very strong uh, hearing, and they didn't want to do it in an open hearing at the time. And then it took me well over a year to testify openly. And when they did, which I hoped that C-SPAN could cover it, because he made sure that C-SPAN did cover the hearing with Milian Rodriguez, and I specifically requested from Kathleen Smith and Jack Blum from his committee that I wanted to testify with C-SPAN coverage and uh, they say, oh yeah, this is going to be a lot of coverage. And when I arrived there, uh, they put me like a number five to testify. It was 4.30 in the afternoon and there was no television camera to cover my testimony. And in that uh, hearing, 
he had to admit that, that he believed me, that it wasn't true. Then I let later uh, learn, because he didn't even say at the time, that they had run a lie detector test of Milian Rodriguez, and he proved that the two crucial questions that he had they asked about me, that he was lying, and on the third one, he decided not to continue with the lie detector test. You mean we weren't there when you came to testify? No, sir. No one was there, no television camera? Oh, they, I, there was a camera, but it wasn't there anywhere. And I specifically requested there would be cameras in there. But I guess when the, uh, he have for so long, it's amazing the millions of dollars that he has spent of taxpayer money in that investigation, trying to prove that the country were involved in drugs. And then when nothing come out, uh, you know, he, he just let it go right. And then when I tried for him to put this in uh, on television and let the people know the truth, uh, he was sort of pushed aside. What, uh, well, so that the audience will understand, we don't, Senator Kerry doesn't tell C-SPAN when to carry his hearings and vice versa. Uh, the point, though, it's interesting because we carried most of those hearings. And I'm, just, I'm interested to hear that you say we weren't there. What yeah. day of the week was it? Well, I forgot what day it was, but for example, they had this day they had Admiral Murphy in it. But he, he, uh, he had me uh, like number five witness. They started at 8 o'clock in the morning or 9 o'clock in the morning, and my hearing was about 4.30 in the afternoon. So at that time, even the reporters were gone out of the room. Well, if we were there in the beginning, we were there in the end, is the only thing, because we stayed from the beginning. Well, then they somehow they choose a day that you were not there. What day of the week was this, a Friday? I forgot what, the, what day it was. Jack Blum. You, here's a, on, on page 256, Jack Blum's wimpish reaction. You feel strongly about Jack Blum. Yes. Who I is he? I don't like the way. He's a, a lawyer that apparently came out uh, out of the uh, uh, Institute for Policy that head by uh, Ambassador White which everybody knows is a very uh, liberal individual. And actually, I didn't realize at the time that they were the ones who, who got Kerry involved in this, uh, in this investigation, this, the group from Ambassador White. Ambassador White used to be the ambassador to, to uh, El Salvador? El Salvador, at the, uh, at the end of Jimmy Carter's uh, presidency. And Jack Blum worked for him? Yeah, he was a member of the trustee of the board of trustee of, the, of uh, Jack Blum's, uh, of, of, excuse me, of Ambassador White organization. And, and it was, it was it, it's fascinating to, when you see the relationship between Jack Blum, Kerry's committee, uh, the Christic Institute, who was recently thrown out of court all the things that they did with that uh, completely outrageous uh, claim of uh, assassination teams and, uh, and the assassination of a then pastora, that probably you're familiar with it, that lasted for over a year until finally uh, Josh King threw it out of court in the Miami area. And they made people spend millions of dollars in it. And they were trying to accuse. And then you got the Christian Institute giving credibility to the investigation because it said a Senate subcommittee is, uh, and it's, it's, it's always the same people. You got Jack Law involved, Senator Curry's committee, uh, the Christian Institute, and they were all the same thing. Renicky is one of the sources that all of them use to prove to be a liar, and uh, it's amazing. So one of the reasons you wrote this book was because you didn't get coverage all during that period that you thought you deserved to tell your story. Yes, it's very hard when they accuse you of narcotics being involved in narcotics, not being true. And you see a publicized newspaper like in El Salvador, in Guatemala, all over the United States, and then when a senator say they believe you, it doesn't appear anywhere. And did Senator Kerry eventually say he believed you? Oh, yes. He said in the, in the open hearing, but there was no television coverage there. And I do have the transcript from the Senate that said that exactly the same thing. Plus, it added the fact that Milian Rodriguez was proved to be a liar in the lie detector test. What impact did it have on your life in Miami and with your family once your story started becoming public? Uh, prior to this book, in other words, did it have a negative impact on the family? Your wife's called no, you? We live, we live in a community that uh, is very sympathetic to, the, uh, to anything that has to do against communism. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, I was people who doesn't know me, people who knows me, it doesn't bother me at all because they know exactly what I have done and where I stand. But people who doesn't know you and they get this type of allegation from a, a congressional committee is very disturbing. Chapter 18. I learned sometimes painfully in the weeks and months following my initial Capitol Hill testimony that people tend to deal not in the truth as it really is, but the truth as they want to see it and the facts be damned. And you go on to talk about the press. In, in, in some detail. You say, in, in my own case, I found scores of repertorial errors of fact. Some might be considered minor, but taken as a body of work, they led me to the inescapable conclusion that too many journalists just don't care very much either about the facts or telling the truth. 
and then you go on to give examples. Tell us some of the examples. Oh, we had, uh, for example, reports of the, uh, an organization, Oil in the Rolling Stone, a piece in the Rolling Stone that make the same echo of the Curry Committee, a, an operation they invented called uh, Black Eagle, and they claimed that the, all of these people were involved, that I was involved in an operation before uh, North uh, operation in supporting the contract, which never existed. That's the, the story where uh, they used uh, that there was an Israeli operation uh, in support of the Contra before Oliver Norris. They had met, for example, General Bustillo in, back in 1983 in El Salvador for this operation. There were a story, for example, that I, I cite in there, which fortunately was killed, uh, I would say, for example, in ABC, uh, where they had Brennicki, again, the same player of Curry's committee, uh, saying that I was in Panama telling pilots uh, that don't worry about it, the Vice President is supporting this operation 100%. Uh, it was an operation, allegedly, for drugs and uh, and the uh, resupply of the country, which never existed. And I challenged them. I said, look, tell me what day it was. Well, they couldn't come up with the exact date. I said, tell me within two weeks. Because the month that they said that I was doing that in Panama, I flew extensively with the Salvadorian Air Force against the guerrilla, and 99% of the chances were that the day that they will picked up, I will be able to tell them that what operation I was, who was my co-pilot, the tail of my helicopter, and the result of the operation. So when the other source that they had uh, could not give any of this detail, they eventually killed the source. But there was a lot of, of this uh, misinformation all over. Brennicky. Is that Richard Brennicky? Right. Who is he? I don't know. I, I have read later on that he was, a, a, I believe, a businessman from Oregon who claimed that he worked for the CIA. He claimed that he worked for the, uh, uh, for the Israeli. And I believe he's under indictment right now for lying. Uh, he portraying a federal agent. Like he said he used to work for the CIA and produce a, uh, a fake document uh, from the agency. Who's a Jose Blandon? Well, I never knew of him until I saw it in one of the tables. Uh, I think it was either Senator Curry or, or Leslie Cockburn, which is the same group that manipulated all of this operation. And uh, he claimed at one point in time, which is put, was put out of context. I, I remember seeing a tape from him saying, yes, Felix Rodriguez was the one that uh, well, I saw him the first time on television because I never met him in my life. That's Jose Blondon, and who is he? Well, I read that he was uh, an advisor to Noriega, an intelligence advisor to Noriega at one point in time. Now, he's, this is a few weeks ago, the day of the attempted Panamanian coup against General Noriega. He is standing in the Senate radio and television gallery, and you'll see in just a moment that there are senators from both sides of the political fence. Mm -hmm. Senator Helms. Mm -hmm on the conservative side, Senator Kerry on the liberal side, and others, including Senator D'Amato. Um, is he, a, a, in your opinion, a reliable witness? Well, see, I don't know because I don't know him, because when he was put in context, what happened, uh, the way I saw it in there was, uh, he, they were trying to portray this operation that never existed, all right, that I was working with the Israeli to supply the contract before North's operation. And then they shine Blandon saying, yes, there was a man in El Salvador called Felix Rodriguez, who was helping the resupply of the country. Now, if he was referring to a time with Oliver North, then he was correct. If he was referring to a time that never existed before, of course he was lying. But I don't know whether he was used in that context or not. You wrote in your book, from my experience, only witnesses whose views were ideologically opposed to Kerry's and Blum's anti-contra policy were questioned aggressively. One of Kerry's fellow senators, Republican Mitch McConnell, privately wrote the Massachusetts Democrat that an investigation was turning into a witch hunt. Did Senator McConnell help you in this process? Well, I went to him and talked to him when, they, when he was in the committee with Kerry, and I wanted to testify openly, and Kerry would not have me to testify after I saw uh, Milian Rodriguez's testimony on television. So he helped me in trying to get Kerry to have an open hearing with me, and for a long time he didn't. So he provided a, a press conference in the Senate where everybody was, including most of the network, and they filmed it and it was never aired. I even brought a paper to Senator Kerry saying that it's obviously from the testimony of Milian Rodriguez and myself that one of the two is lying. And I wanted the committee to pursue it to the very end and give the full strength of the law to that one which is lying, who was committing perjury. And I signed that. And I put that on the, with my uncle. Uh, with an uh, affidavit to them, to the committee, to make sure that whoever was lying of the two of us would be prosecuted to the maximum extent of the law. And I don't know whatever happened to that document, because he gave satisfaction to me, but I don't guess, I guess they never uh, give an additional sentence to Milian. Or maybe they were afraid that Milian would come back and say that they promised him some leniency by lying. 
How many interviews have you given so far on your book? Oh, I guess it's just... Uh, just have you, how long have you been on... Have you, are you on the tour? Yes, uh, it's about three or three days tour. What's the reaction? I think it's been very positive. Are you getting an opportunity to tell your side of the story? Uh, most of the places, yes. When they, people disagree with you strongly, what is it over at this stage? When is that? What do people strongly disagree with you about in your, in your tour at this point? Have you done radio call-in shows and things like no. that where people react? Are people, I mean, do, do you get a lot of opposition to your point of view? No, as a matter of fact, I had uh, two radio shows in New York, and uh, the one that had calls in called, there was not a single negative call. They were all very positive. Why do you think that you had such a rough time here in this city with the committees? I mean, do you it was a political year, in my opinion, and it was very important for them, not the truth, but the perception. And I think that's what Curry's committee pursued to the very end. The perception of the American people that the president or the vice president then was lying to see who will uh, probably generate some votes for the uh, Democratic side. And once the, the, the election was over, then the, they let me uh, aside. What do you think of Oliver North? I met, I really am not I cannot talk with that authority about him because I didn't know him that well. Uh, when I first met him, I liked him very much. Uh, his ideas were very much uh, along with mine, uh, very positive, and uh, he supported my going to El Salvador for a helicopter concert uh, very, very much, very, very good. Uh, nevertheless, uh, I guess for a man to be involved in that many things that he was involved was kind of hard, and it was uh, almost impossible to really master. Uh, 15 or 20 different operations where he had his hand on. You do write, though, that when you visited him in his office that he said some things about you that weren't true. Right. What were those? Well, I talked to him. He accused me. I was uh, talking openly on the telephone line. There was a security reason. I asked him to prove it. Uh, he told me that he could not because those were uh, uh, under the Freedom of Information Act. Uh, uh, they could not uh, give it to me unless, you know, uh, I guess I will sign for it. And I'll tell him, I say, look, I'll sign to your release from the CIA, FBI, NSC, whatever you want, but prove to me that I am a security risk. And he never came up with any document to substantiate what he has said. But I believe to a great extent that he was led by other people who I was critical of because of the poor equipment that was being uh, used in the resupply operation. And God knows all the things that they were telling him at the time. You wrote, one is that North had grandiose ideas about himself. What do you mean? Well, I was one time, for example, sitting in his office, and uh, he received a phone call from somebody, and he said in the telephone, I have in front of me my chief of operation in Central America. And that was the time that I just started to work with him, and there was no, no such an organization as a chief of operation in Central America for him. I was just uh, helping him in, in implement a, uh, uh, the help of the Nicaraguan resistance, which I strongly supported. He also had the habit of telling people that I had been recruited by him. Indeed, he would make a point of keeping my old friend Don Gregg in the dark when it came to my participation in his covert contra operations. Why? Perhaps because Don would not have approved of the way he was going about it. Donald Gregg, current ambassador to Korea, right. is your friend. Yes, he is. Used to be a top aide to current President George Bush, then vice president. Right. Why are you friends with Don Gregg? Well, we go back to Vietnam, back in 1970, 71, or 72. So Don Gregg was the regional chief in the area uh, near Saigon, Ben Hua, uh, where I was working with the PRU, the Provincial Reconnaissance Unit. That's where I worked out the concept that was later very uh, effective in El Salvador. So knew, uh, Don was my boss at that point in time, and he knew of the success of the operation uh, in, in Vietnam. And we continue the friendship and relationship all through this year. And we still are very close friends. What do you like about Don Gregg? He's a very straight individual. He's a very honest individual. And uh, he's one individual that uh, people who know him can tell you that he's uh, a fantastic guy. Uh, for example, uh, and a very straight individual. All of these publicized memorandum that came out uh, in the Iran-Contra later on uh, that questioned it. Uh, because he said that there was a resupply of the country to be discussed, which was never discussed. He was the one who found it, and he was the one who turned it over to the committees. Another of Norse qualities was naivete. Why do you say that in your book? I don't think he was that much uh, knowledgeable. A lot of these operations uh, in paramilitary activities, 
that he was involved, and that's perhaps where he was misguided to a great extent. And uh, it's, I don't know his really background in, in paramilitary operation, but uh, what we were doing in Central America, resupplying the, uh, that operation where he got his people, and I don't think they really knew that much about it. When was the last time you were in combat of any kind or any kind of a skirmish? Uh, Early this year, I was flying in, in El Salvador. As a matter of fact, that's when we did uh, one program, television program, of 60 Minutes, and uh, Mike Wallace was one, one of the helicopters, and we even took fire that time. We had one uh, pilot, uh, not pilot, one soldier killing one of our helicopters and the other one badly wounded. Are you on call to do more work like this if they want it? I, always, it's, uh, I, I think I will continue after this, this tour to, to fly in El Salvador uh, as long as there is communist guerrillas in that area taking any chances of writing this book in the middle of the possibility that you might do more work for the CIA? No, I, I finished working for the CIA in 1976, and I believe from the uh, exposition, I don't think the... But if there is an opportunity that I can have, it will certainly be available. But I doubt it very much that they will call upon me. Who will you work for, then, if you go back down to El Salvador? No, I'm not working for anybody. I volunteer my service as an individual to help the Salvadorian. Since I got my retirement, I don't need the pay from anybody. And uh, they gave me a place to sleep and to eat in the air base in there. So uh, I just got my, my own uh, retribution from my feeling that I are still contributing in something worthwhile. They have not abandoned the fight that I started in, in 1961, uh, uh, when the Bay of Pigs, that I have not abandoned the people who died in, in that time. And my commitment, I guess, will more or less be finished when Cuba is free, when Cuba is not yet free. Think Cuba will ever be free in your lifetime? Oh, I am very convinced of it. They will be. And probably sooner than a lot of people expect it. If somebody came to you today and said, uh, Felix, we've got another mission for you. We want you to go assassinate Fidel Castro. Would you do it? I don't think at this point in time there is a situation where assassination will solve a problem down there. I think that it's going to take care by itself the political internal uh, situation in there. And uh, I feel very strongly that perhaps in the next two years we will see a free Cuba, or at least a, a tremendous change uh, from the present political situation and in a, in a heading toward a democracy that will eventually become one. What do you think of Daniel Ortega? I especially have been reading lately about uh, what he has been uh, canceled, the ceasefire. Uh, I hope that they will go through with the uh, election. I hope that they can really be honest about it and then take the consequences themselves of the result of the election. I believe that lately uh, I was reading that the polls show that the Violeta Chamorro have a quiet heading over uh, Daniel Ortega and perhaps he's trying to see how he can get away from that election. Obviously, in the past, we didn't have the support of the U.S. Congress 100%, so I think it's important to give an opportunity to this uh, uh, election and to this uh, initiative in Central America. But at the same time, I believe it's very important that if it doesn't work, we have a very close Congress working with the President of the United States to make sure that we do work together to create free democracies in that part of the world. You've seen a lot of revolutionaries. What do you think of Daniel Ortega as a revolutionary? Is he tough? Daniel Ortega is the, is the creation of Fidel Castro, in my opinion. And uh, he responds to a great deal to Fidel and uh, Fidel's support in that part of the, of, the, of the area in his country. I don't believe he has the popular support of the people. Uh, and I believe that the, there are uh, free elections in there that uh, he definitely Violeta Chamorro will win and then remain to be seen where they will turn over the reign of power to a democracy. You write in your book, page 235, few U.S. congressmen, in fact, have taken adequate time to personally examine the problems in El Salvador. It is far more pleasant for them to travel on fact-finding trips to Paris, Rome, and London. And when they do visit this country, they all too often arrive for only a few hours with their minds made up already. They are prepared to support only those issues they've set into their own personal agendas. Fair right. criticism? You find a lot of the, of the congressmen that go down there that have, uh, uh, they do not agree with El Salvador. They go and visit the same people uh, from the left in El Salvador that will tell them what they want to hear. Uh, most of them really doesn't go to the countryside or try to go and, and go to the hospital. Uh, I don't say all. I say a lot of them don't go into the hospital and see really uh, the damage of the communist minds are doing on the soldiers and civilian uh, in the area. And you got a lot of problems that they will take. Uh, they will take, for example, um, uh, in not, not only that they will. They will. Uh, let me see if I can get it. Putting work correctly. Uh, a lot of time when they have problems with the administration, uh, they take actions which are not what they are seeing there. For example, 
uh, we see when the Congressman Obi uh, caught the, the supply of the helicopter, he was 500 to El Salvador. He was having a problem then with the administration. And the 500 was the helicopter I was using to fly three top level to make sure that there was no civilian casualties, because it's the only helicopter at that altitude that can determine uh, civilians uh, from, uh, uh, from military or guerrilla troops. You suggest in your book that Congressman Obi was responsible for some El Salvadoran deaths. Well, if you look at it from their perspective, he at one point in time uh, turned down uh, the resupply of, uh, of uh, 500 helicopters into the area, which was vitally to be used uh, for actually spotting the guerrilla. Uh, before, and that was one of the problems that we had in there, is uh, when there is a contact in the area and they try to bomb a place, if you don't have an eyeball to eyeball contact with them, you may be two or three hundred meters off in a very heavily populated uh, country, you may hit the wrong people. So the 500 is actually the helicopter that will determine the exact location of the guerrilla and eliminate uh, the civilian casualties. And because he had a problem with the administration, he hauled on and delivering five huge 500 helicopters and it took a long time to the ambassador and to the head of the mill group to finally convince him to release it one at a time. We only have about two minutes left, and I want to show the audience a couple things, and we're going to have to ask Mark on this camera to do that. On your left lapel mm -hmm. is a couple of buttons there. One of them looks like some kind of a combat ribbon, and the other one looks like... I mean, explain to us, and we'll get it on the screen here in just a second. Okay. What are those two things? This one on top is the, uh, the CIA uh, Intelligence Star for Valor. And then the bottom one is the, is the bottom for the uh, Veteran of Foreign Wars. Okay, right, and then you have a, a, a tie clasp on that I want the audience to see and ask you what that says. Uh, from here it looks like it says George Bush, does it? Yes, it is the, um, the tie clip that uh, then Vice President Bush gave me the first time that I visited his office in January of 1985. I am very proud of it and to wear it. This is the book, and it's written by Peter.